Well, welcome to the discussion. Uh, and I really feel quite humble in introducing our speakers because they all have much more experience of me in actual making and negotiating peace. Uh, I've only ever sort of reported on where there isn't peace, where there is war or where there's an attempt at peace. But as a journalist, and I'm sure um, Mary will find this as well, one does come pretty close to the um, various factors that make things work or not work. You see them at first hand, you report on them, and after a while <coughs> you learn a bit and you sometimes think, uh, why don't the people involved uh, spend a little bit more time thinking about it? Uh, I, as a humble journalist, could probably see where they're going wrong, and they may not know where they're going wrong, or they don't wish to admit where they're going wrong. And where they go wrong, of course, uh, there's a whole variety of factors. And to answer this question in a single phrase is impossible, because I hope over the course of the next uh, hour and a half we will tease out the various things that are the dangers to peace and when it sticks when it doesn't stick. First of all, of course, the obvious question is, who makes the peace? Is it the people involved in the conflict themselves, or is it somebody imposing a peace on them from outside? And that, obviously, uh, is much more likely to unravel if the people involved in conflict are not themselves part of the deal, or, in fact, the deal is not between them. The second obvious question is, uh, how do you implement the peace? Is it up to the people who have... Uh, been previously at war, and what is the mechanism for implementing it? Is it simply a ceasefire, if this is a, uh, a civil conflict? If it's a state-to-state -state conflict, it's presumably a, tre a treaty between states? Or is it some outsiders coming in to bomb one side to bits so that it simply surrenders, or whatever it might be? Then the question is, who has an interest in peace? And I think that this is something that's not often asked enough. Because quite often, everyone will profess an interest in peace, but actually, in their hearts, quite a lot of people have no intention, even from the start, of making it stick. Partly because this is, uh, they have not accepted the need for reconciliation, partly because the urgency of stopping the fighting hasn't yet reached the level of sufficient hurt to themselves or their families, partly because they're being paid to carry on with the conflict, and partly because they cannot imagine any other life except that of fighting. And unfortunately, we've seen it all too often. The idea that people are not yet reconciled inside their hearts to the idea of living with those they've been fighting against, uh, that is all too common. Peace has been imposed on them. Someone has come along and said, you know, for the sake of stability of your region, your country, our world, whatever, you will not fight further, uh, and you will all come and sign this piece of paper and various people have no intention of doing it. You will also see people whose own future uh, is bleak without the career they had waging war. For some people, that is or was the high point of their lives. They were someone who mattered, who gave orders, who had people killed, who led the killing, who, who did all the exciting things, uh, and I'm afraid uh, the kind of people who are attracted to that and for whom this is a lifeblood are the psychopaths who are very hard to reach, for whom that way of life is all important. We saw this particularly, say, in Northern Ireland, where the actual hard core of people waging war was really down to no more than you could count them in the dozens at most. And these were people who could not be reached by ordinary means of sensible negotiations about political futures because their way of life was built on their idea of themselves as fighters and glorious fighters at that for whom self-validation meant showing that people listened to you when you gave the orders. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, what's the economic interest in it? And very often there is no economic interest in making peace. Uh, you can uh, amazingly find that, well, if you look at the press reports, a lot of people have joined ISIS for the money. They've got money to pay. They will pay people to come from abroad, earn money as a fighter, join up, be part of the caliphate, give yourself an identity, give yourself a glorious future uh, and a pa possible uh, death as a martyr, and be paid dollars for doing so. And I'm afraid mercenary motives are as strong as ever. And then, of course, the other problem is that you're not taking into account national narratives. You make a peace or you ignore the danger of war because you forget what the history is. We will hear from Colonel Brendan O'Shea, I'm sure, a lot about Bosnia. 
But in particular, we have to think of the emotional residence of somewhere like Kosovo for the Serbs. What is it about uh, Kosovo? Well, you have to look at the history and see what it meant to their identity. Similarly, you have to think, why are the Russians so implacable about Ukraine? Well, the Russian church, the Russian Orthodox Church, began in Kiev. It began in Rus. Uh, it didn't begin in Moscow. And for the Russians, who are deeply back into uh, the Orthodox Church as their symbol of national identity, what matters is where their history began. Uh, and therefore, for them, the, the idea of Ukraine sucked away into some other non-Russian sphere is very difficult for them to accept. Uh, and it's not just, though a large part of the blame, of course, is Putin's opportunism and his ambition, but there is a real emotional resonance among the Russians of uh, what Ukraine means. Uh, and I particularly call on this because it's one of the conflicts going on at the moment. And I often say people forget emotional residence at their peril. Uh, with the Ukraine conflict, I made a slightly glib comparison, which a lot of people suddenly sort of scratched their heads and thought about. But supposing you had uh, the week before the referendum in Scotland, you had the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, standing on the streets of Edinburgh and saying, you have been subject to English oppression for 300 years. We are standing with you in thinking it is time you actually made your own decision and your own way, and we will support you. Uh, what would the reaction be in London? Absolute fury. Who is this man? Get out. This is our sphere. Similarly, Deputy Secretary of State for the United States, standing in the streets of Kiev on the Maidan, saying, we support your struggle and your need to be free and the need for your own self-determination. Similar reaction. Ukraine, part of the Russian Empire for 300 years. Uh, Ukraine, a large, a large part of it Russian-speaking, similar religion, in many cases, similar people. The reaction in Moscow, fury. And we simply didn't see that coming. So forgetting a nation's history is a surefire way of making a peace deal almost impossible to enforce right from the start. Now, we're going to look at individual uh, experiences uh, in very different areas, uh, and different issues will arise. So we'll start straight away with Mary, who is the Africa editor of the BBC and has reported from all over the continent, particularly East Africa, particularly the Horn of Africa, Somalia, from where I understand you have just come back, one of the most intractable conflicts, it seems to us outsiders, things are getting a little bit better. But I want to know, Mary, are they actually getting better, or is that just because we're distracted by conflicts elsewhere? Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for coming. I, yes, I want to talk about this um, question, why doesn't peace stick? Just, I'm going to just focus on Somalia. I've been reporting on Somalia for more than 20 years, I first went there in 1994 as a fresh young journalist out of university and it was already a country at uh, br brutal civil war and it still is uh, more than 20 years later. And my answer to why doesn't peace stick using Somalia as an example it has some echoes with, with what Michael's been saying. Uh, it, peace doesn't stick in Somalia because people don't want peace to stick in Somalia. Some people who were born there before, uh, after 1991 don't even know what peace looks like, feels like, smells like. I don't know what peace looks like, feels like, smells like, sounds like in South Somalia, for example, Mogadishu. I have never been to Mogadishu when I don't hear guns, firing, I don't hear suicide bombings, I don't lose people there who I know on a pretty much weekly basis. So they don't know what peace is, those people anymore, I'm afraid to say. Um, the fighters, they don't want peace because, like you said, they, uh, that's how they earn their money and you're going to get much better money fighting for Al-Shabaab or for one of the clan militias than you are, or for tossing a grenade into a market, you get $20 for that, whoever you are. That's much more than most people are going to earn. So it's, it's a salary. 
um, the business people, and this is, I think this is the key to Somalia. Um, if I was tasked with trying to do something about it, luckily I'm not, I'm a journalist, I'm just here to report it, I would go for the business people. Because if they want peace to come to Somalia, peace will come to Somalia tomorrow. That is my feeling, and I can talk about that more a little bit later. Uh, peace doesn't come to Somalia because I don't think countries in the region want peace to come to Somalia. At least they don't want stability. They don't want a strong Somalia. Ethiopia landlocked with a very long border, history of war with Somalia, Kenya. Um, all those countries have, they have their own Somali populations. They're pretty scared of Somalis. Somalis are very dynamic, very good at business. They control the economies of places, much of Kenya and Ethiopia. So I think they have an interest in at least a weak Somalia. The uh, peacekeepers who are there, African Union peacekeepers, there's thousands and thousands of them, mainly from Uganda and Burundi, they don't want peace in Somalia because they earn $1,000 a month. They'd never get that if they were serving soldiers at home, and their governments cream off some of that money. They don't, they're making money. They don't want peace in Somalia. And I'm afraid to say, and I'm sure lots of people will disagree with me, the international community, whatever that mean, doesn't, means, doesn't want peace in Somalia because the United Nations, if you work for them, you have big fat salary, you get danger money, you have, you, most of the time you're sitting in Nairobi in the nice hotels, having big um, money, occasionally flying into Mogadishu to a compound in the airport, um, you feel really, really cool. You don't even go out into the city and see what it's like, and you get very rich very quickly. I think lots of journalists don't want peace to come to Somalia because they'd be out of a job, and I myself have been accused of kind of, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of the work that I do, my daily bread and butter is reporting Somalia and other African conflicts. If they all came to an end, I'd probably be fired by the BBC. <laughs> so that's an, and also journalists can look really, really brave in Somalia. There's a place, there's a hotel that's extremely safe, really near the airport. And if you stand there and do your piece to camera, number one, you're not going to get um, hurt because it's so, so safe. If you stand, if the camera angle is from here, you'll get yourself against the shattered uh, city of, of Mogadishu. If you have the camera angle here, you get all the displaced camp behind you. And if you have your camera angle here, you'll get the peacekeepers kind of on the, the previously they were on the, sort of it looked like a front line. It was a pretend front line. So you could just stand there and it was if you were being the most brave and sort of human journalist in the world. So it's very good for making journalists look um, brave. Uh, and I also think a lot of humanitarian organizations don't want peace to come to Somalia because they'd be out of a job. So I think that so many groups are not interested in peace um, that, you know, f f f for the country that sort of has been locked in this situation for so long, how you're going to unpick that is going to be extremely difficult. Very interesting and rather depressing. A um, couple of questions would arise. Uh, is the conflict such that the families themselves are not suffering enough pain? Because sometimes conflicts end when the f cost to the soldiers' families is so high, and particularly for the women, it is so high that in the end they just say, stop it. Stop going it. Has that point not been reached? Well, I think in a way that piece, that, that point was reached very early on because, I mean, the, the war that, the civil war that came to Somalia came, it wasn't some front line over there. The front lines were people's yards um, and their families were just blown up. You know, the mortar shell will land on your sister, will be dead. You know, I mean, it, it's right there. Um, you're seeing it every day, and p women and children are still seeing that every day. But what, what, what's happened in a lot of parts of Somalia, you've got about 2 million people have left, and it's a country of maybe maximum 10 million people. And I will talk a bit later about some bits of the country that have become peaceful, and they offer quite interesting examples. But in the war-torn areas, for example in Mogadishu, the, the women and children who are left behind are members of minority clans who are considered subhuman by the other Somalis. Um, and they are the people who live 
in amongst the city in structures made out of their sort of, they look like igloos, twigs, pieces of plastic bag, they, just sand underneath. I mean, it is the most basic form of living any human being could, could ever be expected to live. And the children that you see there, they are feral. They're feral children. But because they're members of minority clans, Nobody cares enough mm. about them. The others have mainly gone out and live in... There's a million living in Kenya. There's 800 or 700,000 probably living in Ethiopia. The wider diaspora is about a million. So, in a way, the people that are going to say stop have gone. Yes. yes. And the other point, you, you said almost nobody has an interest in peace. Would you put it down as strongly as there are people actively trying to sabotage any attempts at peace? Are any att not much is being made to stop the thing, but if businessmen agree among themselves that they would like to trade with each other, do you see the hand of some people trying to simply disrupt any potential opportunity for peace? Well, what happens now is you get an awful lot of killings in Mogadishu of people, for example, members of parliament, members of the government, and some of them are genuinely committed to try to... I mean, a lot of it's for their own benefit, but some of them are committed to some kind of stability, and they get shot, they get assassinated, and that's always blamed on Al-Shabaab, but it's very rarely Al-Shabaab. If it's Al-Shabaab, Al-Shabaab will call me and tell me, because they don't... They, they do admit to what the killings that they commit. It's usually other business competitors or political competitors that kill them. So the whole sort of language of politics and business is done through a gun. Mm. So for that language to change, unless, well, unless you get the business people realizing or deciding that they're going, they'll have more to gain from peace than war, that will ca continue, and the business people don't really want peace because then they might have to start paying proper taxes, um, abiding by certain rules, and things like that. Mm. So, it is um, I at least in that part of Somalia, it's very intractable. Yes. Well, that is a fairly bleak picture to start with. Now, uh, Colonel Brendan O'Shea, you've um, been uh, involved deeply in three areas: uh, Lebanon, uh, Africa and also, of course, Bosnia. And you have seen peacemaking attempts in all three. Uh, there seems to be a lack of news in Bosnia at the moment. Does that mean there's any peace going on there? And how have you seen the different efforts uh, vary according to the different organizations for which you have worked? And I'll leave it to you to explain how you see the different perspectives. Okay, t <coughs> thank you, Michael. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is that every conflict is different. Um, and you know, just because, uh, for example, in, in the media at the moment, there's almost no coverage of Kosovo, even less of Bosnia. It doesn't mean that the situation is resolved. And, of course, you can't compare either of those two situations today with what you've just described, Mary, because we're in, in different phases. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that everything is fine. I mean, if I start in Kosovo and kind of work backwards, I mean, Kosovo today is partitioned, um, and yet we've had a huge international investment in Kosovo, uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, Bosnia is still partitioned. Um, and Haven mentioned at the start that, you know, civil wars recur and restart. And I suppose just because things have the appearance of being stable doesn't mean that we should be um, complacent in relation to our, our understanding of what's going on. I mean, and then you have to ask yourself, well, why is that the case? If, if both of those uh, countries are partitioned, if the tensions still exist, and if, if they're not moving on and developing, then why, why is that the case? And then you kind of, you, you revert then all the way back to the start and you look at the various different efforts to bring peace to the Balkans in general. And I, I served in former Yugoslavia with the UN, with OSCE, um, with NATO and with the European Union. So I've seen all of the main organizations and how they go about their business. And going right back to the start, I mean, if you go back to when Slovenia seceded from, from uh, Yugoslavia back in 1991. Uh, a troika of European diplomats arrived uh, in Zagreb and said, now is the hour of Europe. Europe will fix this. But Europe hadn't a clue how to fix it. The three guys who arrived hadn't a clue how to fix it. Um, and, and of course, it didn't work. And then when that didn't work, it got handed over to the UN. The UN threw 36,000 soldiers at Bosnia, but with a ridiculously weak mandate. And that didn't work. 
And eventually, when that failed, it got handed over to NATO, whose only solution was effectively to bomb the Serbs to the negotiating table. And, and ironically, we're 20 years now since the Dayton Peace Agreement. And the, one, the fundamental mistake that was made at Dayton was that the people who were part of the problem were not allowed to sit at the table. If, if you're part of the problem, you have to be part of the solution. It, it can't be the other way around. And the Bosnian Serbs were represented by Slobodan Milosevic, who was the president of Serbia, for political reasons. That was the first mistake. So whether you like Radovan Karadzic or any of the politicians on the Bosnian Serb side at the time, they weren't there. They weren't permitted to be part of that settlement. And the second thing that happened was Kosovo was not, um, was not introduced uh, on, onto the negotiation table, even though we all knew it was about to explode. And that was done for macro-political reasons. And surprise, surprise, the, paper, the, the, the ink was hardly dry on the, on the Dayton Peace Accords before Kosovo erupted. And then we got into Kosovo, and it followed more or less the same pattern, and the only solution we could come up with in Kosovo was to bomb them to, into uh, submission as well. And then we came up with a solution which is just unsatisfactory. The, it became a, a UN protectorate. Uh, we put 60,000 NATO troops into it, um, and it failed because the local politicians themselves decided we have enough of this, we'll declare our independence, which they did just short of eight years ago. Um, but again, we didn't have the dialogue that we needed to bring a solution to, to, to that particular problem. Um, and it's not resolved. Um, are, are there other ways to do, to, to do this? Yes, of course there are, and we, maybe we could talk about that later on. Mm. But just because it's not in the media, and just because it's not as chronic as what Mary has just described, it uh, doesn't mean that it's all gone away. It, it has anything but gone away. Um, and the fear would be that we would have um, an eruption of violence again. I mean, for example, when, when you consider the manner in which Crimea effectively partitioned or, or seceded from, from Ukraine, uh, is it unreasonable to expect that the Bosnian Serbs sitting in Banja Luka and feeling, uh, well, let's say, not participatory in, in the federation and in the system that they have wouldn't think likewise? And then how do we deal with that problem if, if, if it arises? Mm -hmm. So my experience of this is that uh, it's far from over. And it's far from over because we didn't fix it properly in the first place. Yes. Uh, one thing I would very interested to hear your take on is what is the right degree of military force? Because we hear a lot of talk now it's no good just bombing Syria. Dropping bombs will not defeat an ideology. Dropping bombs will simply hurt more people, and you can't solve any conflict by bombing. On the other hand, there is an argument that if you have uh, combatants who are locked in a kind of unending struggle, uh, actual overwhelming military force, after a bit, will stop it, even if it doesn't last. What is the right role for military force? I mean, the military... The military element of any solution has to be just one element of it, okay? So, and it, you, it must be part of a comprehensive approach. I mean, NATO talks about the comprehensive approach. The UN talks about integrated man mandates. Um, the UN talks about human security, which brings freedom from fear and freedom from want and all that stuff together. But military, uh, using the military instrument on its own will never achieve the ultimate result, which is a peaceful resolution. You use your military for a purpose, but it can only be one line of operation. You, the other line of operation has to be social, cultural, economic, religious, um, educational, whatever it is. But the military line can only be one line. And how strong it has to be, of course, is dependent on, on the problem that you're dealing with at any given time. I mean, I would argue, and everyone's free to disagree with me, it's my personal view, I do not believe you can have a solution in Syria without having... Bashar al-Assad or somebody of sufficient um, um, power within that regime at the table to, to suggest mm -hmm. that somehow or other we can just bomb them into submission uh, or, or let them go away. It, it's just not going to work. Yes. If, if they're part of the problem, they have to be part of the solution. And, and you use the military, I think, to indicate the strength of the will uh, to take action, but it has to be balanced. There, yes. there are so many other instruments that have to be used. Yes. Well, that's a very good way of bridging straight into Terry Waite, because you have had a lot of experience in the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Syria, working with uh, factions and intractable forces there. How do you see, particularly if we're looking at the present chaotic arrangements in the Middle East, how do you see peace sticking or 
there or anywhere. Yeah, and your, your last uh, point makes me want to immediately respond by saying how much I agree with that. Yeah. But uh, I move on. I want to make three uh, simple points. The first is this, and it, it's, I'll tell it in the form of a story. In the years of my captivity, I was alone in solitary. There were other captives who spent time together. And during their time together, the food they were given became very bad. They complained. Nothing happened. And after about six months, the head man came to see them. He said, what is it you're getting? And they told him. And he was not entirely without honor. He said, that's, that's clearly wrong. And he looked into the matter, and he discovered it was the old, old story. The guard had been given so much money to buy food. He had pocketed for himself half that money, and he'd spent the other half on food. And so the group, the captors, took that guard outside, and they shot him, because they said, you betray us in these small matters. Larger matters come along, and you betray the whole organization. Now, the reason I tell that story is that many young people, commendably and understandably, are full of idealism. They resent some of the values, which they see as values, that are held by the West, over commercialism, uh, consumerism, and so on. Uh, they're right in some of their criticisms. They're not right in all their criticisms. It only takes a charismatic leader who might well be a religious fanatic to come along and say to young people, uh, join this organization and the way to defeat and to achieve what it is you wish to achieve is by entering this organization and fighting for the cause. And they do, and they're caught. They're caught in that situation. So I think I raise the question, do we take seriously, do we listen seriously enough uh, to the voices that raise criticism about the dominant economic, social, political models that are operative in the world today? Do we listen seriously enough to that? Seriously enough to those who oppose it and uh, oppose them? That's the first thing. The second point I'd raise is about the personal qualities that are needed for those who would engage in peace. And I make it very simply. Uh, Again, going back to my own experience, if you'll forgive me, I had years without books or papers or anything to read, any, any companionship. There was nothing. And I remember saying to myself, this is a unique opportunity to take an inner journey. You've made many journeys around the world. You've been in constant motion. Now you are fastened in this place. One never knew for how long. You live a day at a time. But now is the chance to take an inner journey and to begin to examine yourself more closely. Now, in my view, anyone who does that, um, and does that with, hopefully, a degree of honesty, will discover that within them, they there is, to put it very simply, light and dark, the negative and the positive. And when one's making that inner journey, one has to somehow beware of becoming totally swallowed by the dark, by the negative side, because then one can become depressed and over-depressed. And the way to treat that is to recognize that we are all human beings, and all have this complex mixture within our nature. And somehow, it's a recognition 
that we ourselves have to constantly be working with ourselves to find the degree of inner harmony that we would wish there to be in the world in which we inhabit. So peacemakers need to understand peace in their own lives and in their own community and how to bring it about there as well as understanding some of the broader economic, social, political, religious issues that we've been talking about. Uh, and that's where I would uh, conclude by saying, yes, there are a whole range of other factors. I look, for instance, at a situation with which one has been concerned for many, many years, and that is the situation between Israel and the occupied territories, between Palestine and Israel. A, a chronic, terrible, terrible situation, a crying disgrace uh, in, in, in the world today. Crying disgrace and the source of many, many other problems which surround that. And there, one says, yes, there are the the very strong factors operative, economic, global politics coming to bear on that situation. The American domestic political agenda which comes to bear on that situation. The negative stereotyping, the fact that people from both sides of the divide are increasingly becoming separate from one from another, not able even now to talk. And talking is not necessarily now by leaders encouraged because by talking it is said you um, encourage and tactically support uh, the other side. If there is going to be peace and if peace is going to stick, and this is my third and fundamental point, people from different backgrounds have to be able to understand uh, themselves and learn to listen and understand a view that is different to themselves and begin to have the dialogue. And the key players, whether you like them or not, uh, providing they are not totally beyond the pale and totally deep into psychosis, need to be a part of that process. Um, something that's distasteful to a lot of people, but absolutely essential. Those are my three points. Yes, very good, Terry. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to um, pull out one point, interesting point you made about uh, we are all made up of uh, light and dark. You know, there is uh, things in everybody and we need to see that or grasp that in the people we have gathered together to make peace. Do you think in the modern practical negotiating world, in other words, the political setting, that the peacemakers or those people trying to get agreement between factions can ever reach out to the sort of common humanity of the other person, or can they only ever see things through a political prism and through the kind of uh, negotiating tactics where the thing has been laid down already? I think we become too trapped in that particular prism, the one you refer to there. I think, particularly in working in the Middle East, if you can begin to enter into, as I put it, a human dialogue, to recognize that the other person has aims and aspirations, has a family, take an interest, a genuine interest. It's no good putting on feigned interest. You have to be, as a peacemaker, um, of course you have to have your strategies in mind, but you have to be able to be a human being with other human beings, to recognize that someone who's a different religion, a different background, a different skin, is also a human being and has a family and has desires and is entitled to live on this earth as much as you are and has a place here. And, those are the, these are, and this is where, in my view, uh, the religion, the churches and, and others, other religious agencies, have a vital role to play. Many of them are duped into thinking, ah, there's nothing that can be done, it must all be left to the politicians. Not true. Not true at all. One of the reasons peace does not stick is because people, ordinary people such as myself and others are on the ground are, seem to be not to be involved in it. Decisions yes. are taken up here above their head. Yes. 
Well, let's all talk among ourselves now. There's a point I want to pick up from you, Mary, which I might put to the others. And that is, uh, you've shown us almost the worst case example in Africa. But you've also cover, covered other places in the continent. And I can think of one in particular where probably they've never had quite such a terrible time. Nobody's had such a terrible time as them. And yet, where peace does seem to stick. Rwanda, a genocide. Uh, it's tension beneath the surface. But at the moment, if you go to Kigali, it's a pretty decent place to walk about in. I mean, do people think that uh, there are examples of places? I don't know whether you would accept that there, that is one. But do people think there are examples we can point to where peace has stuck? And if so, what are the reasons it did stick? For me, the reason why Somaliland it is a remarkable place. Somaliland is completely peaceful. I walk around Somaliland on my own uh, in, in the night. Why? Could because I... it's peaceful. No, but in... why, no, no, no. I mean, no, why yeah, is it peaceful? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, I was coming to that. It's Somaliland's peaceful because it was left alone, and the Somalis developed their own... It was, it was the most grassroots peace-building I've ever seen in Africa, and they built a, a system that works, and it is remarkably peaceful, um, and that's a place that's considered to be part of Somalia. So I, I'd use that as one example. Um, I talk about a country that had a very, very, very long war, Mozambique, that, a war that people thought would never, ever end. And Mozambique, peace was brought to Mozambique, and it was through a combination of things. The church did play a role in that. And I think people there were tired um, of, of the war. Then you have a country like Angola, where the war lasted forever until one man was killed, the rebel leader, Jonas Savimbi. And when he was killed, peace came. So sometimes I think it is a matter, it is really to do with individuals. I'm oversimplifying. Um, and then I did use, we were talking about the role of violence. Um, so that is one place where there was a role of violence. And I was thinking about Mali, where a few years ago, um, Al-Qaeda took over two thirds of the country in this most rapid, rapid way. And then France, <laughs> unilaterally, just went and bombed the hell out of them. And they were pushed back, and Mali is unstable, but violence, very, very quick and ferocious violence, stopped something that could have been a lot worse. Um, and then I, then I talked about um, uh, Liberia, and I'm going to, I would include Rwanda here, because Liberia had the most horrible civil war. Yeah. Um, it, you couldn't make it up even in a film. And I went to Liberia shortly after the Civil War ended, and the man who started the Civil War was President Charles Taylor. Mm. And he was, Charles Taylor was elected, and one of the chants of the population was, he killed my ma, he killed my mother, he killed my pa, he killed my father, so I go vote for ya, I am going to vote for you. Fear. People voted for him. People, he'd murdered their families. They voted for him. Because if you don't vote for him, he's going to just come and kill you. And I'm sorry, but I would put Rwanda there. Because Rwanda might have nice, clean streets. Um, Rwanda might... It has plenty of violence going on in Congo and Burundi, by the way. A lot of that is thanks to Paul Kagame. I'm sorry. It's, it's thanks to the interference of Rwanda, what's happening in Burundi now. Um, there it is fear. It is a control of people's minds. Um, so I, don't, I would not call Rwanda peaceful at all. I'd call Rwanda one of the most frightening places in Africa well, today. It's certainly fairly dark. Can you think, Brendan, of a place, can you think of a, a situation where you think peace has stuck or will stick? And if so, why? Um, if, if I could just come back please, to Liberia. Please, yes, please, first, please. I, I worked in Liberia in 2004 and 2005. And I would have a slightly different take on, on Liberia. I believe that in Liberia, the civil war was so savage, they literally fought themselves to a standstill. Uh, Taylor was given an asylum in Nigeria to get him out of the, out of the mm -hmm. equation. And, and effectively, the United Nations occupied Liberia. Uh, but the mission was good because it had, um, it had called what was called an integrated mandate plan with eight core goals and a raft of, of sub-goals. Yeah, I, and, and I, just if I could just come in, I think that that was like post the Charles Taylor presidency. Yeah, once he, once, yeah. Once he was yeah. gone. But, and, but the problem there was that 
there was a there was a requirement or, or an international initiative uh, or imperative rather to get rid of him and, and to stabilize the situation but Rwanda hasn't really improved I mean all we did was stop the violence and there hasn't been international economic investment they still don't have electricity they still don't have sanitation and running water this is uh, Liberia Liberia, Liberia yes yes, yes. Uh, and, and uh, and in the longer term, where is that going to go? If, 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 we, if the international community doesn't make a profound investment in Liberia uh, and, and uh, fulfill the promises that were made, uh, it has the potential to revert back to something else uh, in the longer term. There's also another issue with Taylor. I mean, Taylor was granted asylum in Nigeria. He disappeared off the scene. And then at a later stage, uh, that asylum was revoked. Yes. So the moral of that story is, and I'm not defending, far from it, defending Taylor, but what message does it send out to the warlords who are causing the problems today? Because they know for sure if they're offered asylum, uh, it may last for a limited period of time, but there's no long-term guarantee of their personal safety and for those who work with them. So I, I, as a tool to bring it to an end, it worked, and now Taylor's locked up in jail for life and will probably die in prison. Uh, and maybe he deserves that, but the point is, in terms of using that as a tool to resolve conflict, I, I'm not so sure where that goes mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the longer term. Um, in, in terms of trying to find um, a good example of something that's not going to recur, um, I, I'm not so sure, to be honest with you. I, I, I don't think you can ever give that kind of guarantee, but I do think the one thing that came out, and I agree with everything Terry said, uh, I think uh, in terms of trying to develop a process that works. The one thing we cannot do anymore is react to the last atrocity. It, we can't have a situation where, with all due respects to the media, we cannot have a situation where the media drives the reaction. And in, in throughout former Yugoslavia, it was uh, the, the media demand was that something must be done. And of course, something should have been done. But that didn't allow for the debate which was necessary to figure out what the long-term strategy was. If, if you don't start with the end state, if you don't decide how this thing is to be concluded, then all you're going to do is respond to the problem and do something which invariably won't be enough. If you want to have a comprehensive solution, you start at the end, you figure out how it's going to finish and who's going to be part of that solution and then work backwards. So where is the end state? What's the problem? And then the question is not what must we do, it's how do we get from the beginning to the end? And then you figure out your lines of operation. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's standard military planning stuff. That, that's not rocket science. But we don't, it, it, it only gets used by the military. And it only gets used in, in, in very uh, smaller contexts. I, I firmly believe if that kind of thinking were to uh, be used um, you know, at strategic level, I think we'd get far better results. Mm. I could be wrong, but I, I think we'd get better results. Terry, Terry, can I just ask you, what do you think is the actual responsibility of the outside world to make peace or to make peace stick? Because Brendan was saying, you know, if, if the other things don't come in, if people don't invest, businessmen don't offer opportunities, there's no outside interest, and people are just left to their own devices, then it will never work. Do you think the outside world does have a responsibility, a moral responsibility, where there has been a peace deal to make it stick? I think we have uh, the outside world in, uh, has a responsibility, but sometimes I think we have not used that responsibility in the right way whatsoever. Um, I mean, I, I repeat what is simply a very old and hackneyed argument, but uh, Saddam Hussein, right, um, a, a brutal dictator. But I always, I said at the time, and many people said at the time, remove a dictator by force and you release forces that you're not able to control. And I certainly wasn't the only one to say that. Many people experienced in the Middle East said exactly the same thing. When we intervene in the outside world, for example, in Syria, and when the Arab uh, Spring begins to make appearance, or appears to make appearances, um, we make noises to say, yes, we support you, and uh, there's consideration about arming. Well, in my view, in that situation, if we really had got a real deep understanding of these situations, we would enter into a mediating role. Not to say, get rid of another dictator there. Sometimes, better the devil you know than the one you don't know. And I think uh, also, we, I often contrast, just slightly moving on from what you've asked me, I often contrast in my own mind 
uh, two figures who've been prominent in, uh, in recent history. One is dead and the other is still alive. The first one is uh, Yasser Arafat. Now, he always appeared in public with a gun in his holster uh, and gave the image uh, of a gun-toting leader. I contrast that with Desmond Tutu, the patron of uh, this particular event. Now, Desmond um, did, in fact, I worked alongside him many times in South Africa. He did, in fact, take a political role until uh, Nelson uh, was released. When Nelson was released, he stepped back into the background, went truly and more fully into his ecclesiastical role. But he was, what was, the, what was the, the, great, the great values that he stood by in the face of all opposition? I accompanied him to get outside support when he went to visit Mrs. Thatcher mm. uh, to try and get support from that. I accompanied Desmond when he was before the ELOF Commission. I had to give evidence, believe it or not, in support of his character. <laughs> dreadful thing to do. Ridiculous. Anyway, that was, that was the situation he was in. He was in, but what did he do? He stood for truth, for justice, for compassion. Um, he stood not as a racist, but he stood to say, the people I, I belong to are human beings as well as the uh, opposition, the, the, the apartheid opposition. We are all human beings, and he constantly made that message, said, gave that message as a reconciler, but because he stood on fundamental decent values and did not compromise. And he does the same today. I mean, his famous comment about the uh, ANC now, which he has been fearless in criticism, and they've been ostracized for it now by, by um, the black people himself. He's been put to the margin, wasn't even invited to Nelson's funeral, uh, Nelson Mandela's funeral. Um, was given a secondary position there. What did he say? What has he said recently? The ANC stopped the gravy train just long enough to get on it themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, he's been fearless. And that's what peacemakers need to be. They need to be fearless, yes, ready to face opposition, imprisonment, even death, but to stand on fundamental values, not just to be people who come with a tick chart, a chart and say, okay, box one, box two, box three, box four, that's peace. It isn't. It's a much deeper issue altogether. 